I'm delighted that we have such a, such a big audience for this event. It should be a really interesting conversation. What I'm going to do is um, ask Bill some questions for 20 to 30 minutes and then throw it open to questions from you. And we'll end at one because I know that many of you have places you have to be at one. So I really enjoyed this book. I found it extraordinarily stimulating. Sometimes I felt like arguing with it. Other times I thought, absolutely, absolutely. Your book has two subtitles, The Miseducation of the American Elite and The Way to a Meaningful Life. And it seems to me it has two arguments. And I wonder, for those in the room that haven't read the book, if you could characterize those two arguments. Yeah, I think the, I think the easiest way to do that is to, is to give a very short genealogy of the book. That's I wrote great. an essay that came out uh, in 2008. It happened to be right at the time that I was leaving not only Yale but academia. Uh, called The Disadvantages of an Elite Education. Mm -hmm. I would have given it a better title if I thought anyone was actually going to read it. But it was about, <laughs> I mean, it was really about the way the admissions process distorted the students that I saw at Yale. Um, it inculcates careerism and credentialism rather than intellectualism or the development of a sense of purpose. I mean, that, that puts it in a nutshell. Uh, I wasn't the first to mount critiques of the meritocracy. Nicholas Lehman in The Big Test, his history mm -hmm. of the SAT, talks about the, uh, the risk aversion and empty ambition Mm. That, uh, that the system produces, and others have echoed that critique. Um, and I didn't think anyone would see it, really. It, came, it ended up coming out of The American Scholar, which is a, a publication I've been writing for and love uh, for a long time, but not a lot of people read it. Uh, and I figured it was going to sink without a trace. And what happened instead is that, like, literally the fourth day it posted online, uh, it started to circulate among elite college students and recent graduates. And I started to get hundreds of emails. And ultimately, the uh, piece was read well over a million times. But, but it wasn't even like a million in a month. It was a million over year after year after year after year. Like, even the t when the book came out six years later, it was still being read 10,000 times a month. And it was being read by that community. It was circulating in that demographic. Because apparently, I had given voice to the dissatisfactions of those students. And, and the emails all said, thanks for giving voice to my dissatisfactions. Thanks for talking about in public what I only think about. And I thought I was the only person. So then the other thing that happened, like the next day, uh, was that I started to be invited to campuses. Uh, the first talk was at Harvard in the fall, in that fall. And then the next day, I drove to Cornell, and I gave another talk. Uh, and it, it, it was an ongoing dialogue. And, the, and so the original, the original essay was, was really critique. And it, was actually, it wasn't directed at students. It was sour and angry, mm -hmm. as I often am. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and, and so I would say two things. It, it still resonated with them despite the barrier that that represented. And then the other thing is that at those events and in the emails, the things that students always ask me was, what should I do about this? What should we do? But also, like, what should I do? I know I'm trapped in the system. Mm -hmm. What do I do about it? So that ended up being the other half of the book and the second mm -hmm. half of the subtitle. It's actually the middle half of the book. It's parts yeah. two and three. Mm -hmm. um, so the miseducation of the American elite is the critique and the way to a meaningful life. I know it sounds kind of self-helpy, but uh, listen, Authors never write their titles. But also, you know, I, I kind of embrace, I mean, I sort of embrace self-help in the sense that, like, no one else is giving them help. So they need to help themselves. And I'm trying to help them help themselves. It's a book that has a divided argument. It also has a divided audience. Yeah. And I'm conscious of that. I knew, in a sense, it's a flaw in the book. I often address students, and I, I address them in the second person. Mm -hmm. Second person singular, if there were a second person singular. Like, I'm talking to you as an individual because Whatever the grown-ups do, you need to save yourself from the system. And then I'm also addressing the grown-ups, which means sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's people at universities, because we should try to change the system. So it's not so hard for students to, to get a meaningful education and find a sense of, of purpose in life. So as I was reading the first of your books, the, the, the critique of, of, of Ivy League education, I kept thinking, the students that I taught at Berkeley when I was on the faculty here, the students that I taught at Smith and got to know in many different contexts at Smith weren't like that. I kept not recognizing their faces in the mirror that I was, that you were holding up to them. Um, they were quirky. They had a lot, a lot of rough edges. They um, were passionate about many things. And I, I, I was then very um, I'm glad to see that you were recommending to students in the part of your book that's to students, go to a public university. 
Um, go to a liberal arts college, you'll find more passionate engagement with the life of the mind and just with life in general at those places. What is it if you accept the fact that students in these, these kinds of institutions are different and, you know, their general character, what is it about different kinds of institutions that nurtures or fosters or selects for different students? Well, let me say, first of all, that I want to break down those, those sharp lines. And I know that uh, in the book, um, I, I'm drawing them, and it's mm -hmm. partly rhetorical, and I sort of qualify it, uh -huh. and it's partly that I've learned more in the uh -huh. last year, and I think one of the main things that I've learned in the last year is that the system I describe as belonging not just to the Ivy League, but to selective private universities, mm -hmm. and, and maybe the most elite liberal arts colleges, like a place like Pomona, um, most of what I'm talking about is actually uh, not only true across the American university system, but across education at all levels and in all countries. How's that for a big generalization? And, and, and the, piece that, the piece that I just published in Harper's a month ago really yeah. reflects that new awareness that this is really what education looks like in a neoliberal age, mm -hmm. where students are thought of as human resources mm -hmm. um, to be monetized and exploited by the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not selective college admissions per se. Still, I do think there are differences. I think there are institutional differences. Um, and again, also saying that not every student at Yale is the same and there are exceptions mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. There are institutional differences and there are institutional cultures. And last night, I spoke to the parents at Marin Academy, the private uh -huh. school in Marin County. And of course, they all want to know where should we send our kids. Uh -huh. and, I, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I talked uh -huh. about how fit it really is an important thing, even though it's become a cliche. And I think maybe the most important element of fit is the student culture. Mm -hmm. Like, don't go to a school that has an intensely pre-professional student culture. Uh -huh. Liberal arts colleges tend to have a more, a little bit more, and again, it depends on the school. I would never send anyone to Claremont McKenna. It's the mm -hmm. worst place in the entire country. <laughs> but, Do we have any Claremont McKenna like, alums in this you know, room? <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, there's a place like Reed College, which I uh -huh. think has a real commitment to intellectualism. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, student culture and, 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 of course, there's the whole issue of the culture of the faculty, right? I mean, mm -hmm. liberal arts colleges right. do incentivize teaching a little bit better. Mm -hmm. When I recommended public universities, is that, it was actually at a very specific juncture in the argument where I talk about socioeconomic diversity. Mm -hmm. Right. I think public universities, and undoubtedly Berkeley, I mean, in, in some ways it's the, it's the least typical of all public universities, mm -hmm. but I mean, we know that they tend to be very large institutions with large separations between faculties and students and, and a culture that's very much a research university culture, which mm -hmm. means, I mean, Clark Kerr said this a long time ago, and I quote him in the book, mm -hmm. concern yeah, for do. research is inversely proportional concern for teaching, to, for teaching quality. Uh -huh. Not even concern for teaching, it's to teaching quality. Uh -huh. And we all know that. And mm -hmm. we also know that in some ways it's a structural contradiction mm -hmm. that that we've never come to terms with. But on the other hand, a place like Berkeley or all the UCs, 20, um, a third of the upper division are community college transfers. So you get a very different student mix Absolutely. as a consequence Absolutely. of that. Um, Absolutely. And so I'm not at all disputing what yeah. you're saying about um, teaching and the fact that um, universities like this one um, reward research more than teaching. But the student mix is really different for them. The Absolutely. student mix in the, in the Ivy League, which I which I think makes a difference. Right, and I think one of the most pernicious things, and the last section, as you know, is sort of a so societal critique and how we've produced an elite in the yeah. image of these excellent sheep. And one characteristic of them is that they're totally cut off from the people uh, who they've been given responsibility for, right? They're uh -huh. making the decisions for people that they've, they've had almost no contact with throughout their entire lives if they went to elite private universities. Mm -hmm. And certainly I think that that's different at public universities. So say somebody waved a magic wand and made you president of Yale tomorrow. What would you do that, or say put you on the Yale board? What would you recommend to, to change this? Are there changes that could happen short of some sweeping societal change well, the, that yeah. would make things better? Well, you see, that's the thing. I mean, I think I started this journey wa wanting, so to speak, to be president of Yale. I mean, not really, but, but I realized like that's actually the, that's, I mean, what I really want to be is like the czar of American education. And what I would do, and this is my big, this is, look, this is my big, rec wouldn't, wouldn't we all? This is, this is my big recommendation. And since the book came out, I, I take every opportunity I can to say this. Mm -hmm. We need to go back to what Berkeley was in the, you know, before it's charged tuition, right? We uh -huh. need high quality, free, 
widely accessible public higher education. Uh -huh. And that means that the top 10%, not the top 1%, but the top 10%, which may include a lot of the people in this room, need to pay more in taxes. Uh -huh. that, that to me is the only systemic answer. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, there are probably things that places like Yale can do. I mean, we know that over the last 20 years, largely in response to congressional pressure, mm -hmm. the, the, the elite privates have, have made noises about opening up access. Mm -hmm. And there was an article that came out of the Times, I think it may have already been last year, or maybe early this year, that said that after 20 years of trying, there's been no progress. Mm -hmm. Overall, there has been progress at some institutions, and I yeah, think Amherst yeah, is exemplary, and they've really yes, made an effort, and they've really put resources into it, and they're now right. like at the top of the table among uh -huh. private universities. Yeah. So whatever they're doing, I would do. Yeah. Uh, if I were president of Yale. Um, it's but, really but interesting what they did, yeah. which is interesting in and of itself, is that they, um, uh, it was when Tony Marks was president, and he um, knew he di couldn't displace his traditional student constituency, so he made Amherst bigger and says all these slots oh, are for Pell Grant okay. kids. Okay. And well, Amherst go. was rich and could do right. it, and right. um, they had a passionate president who really cared about this and right. put his presidency on the line to do this. And so right. I suppose you could do the same thing. I mean, when the when the obvious admitted women, and I realize women aren't the same as socioeconomic no, no, no. diversity, but when they did it, that was that was essentially what they did. They got bigger. So they didn't oh, have to displace the men. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that uh, we need more leaders in American higher education like Tony Marks who are willing to actually, I mean, I see some of the people who've been president of Yale and other of those institutions, and they're just, there's no, you know, I think you can tell. There's no, there's no, there's no will or even desire to, to shake anything up, and they're, they're sort of stewards of an increasingly global corporation. So would, would we be, But, but yeah, let me just say yeah. again that ultimately I don't think the, even the Amherst, let alone the Yales, are the answer because their business model will always depend on having a lot of rich kids and producing a lot of rich alumni. Yeah. So but, but I think I can anticipate your answer to this question, but would Yale and Harvard and Dartmouth and Penn be better off if they uh, established a kind of minimum cutoff for students who can do the work and just threw all the applications down the stairs and picked the class randomly? Do you think that that would result in a change in this culture? No, I, I don't think it's a bad idea, but um, you would still have to clear the bar. Uh -huh. And clearing the bar, A, uh, makes kids, I mean, I mean, the level of psychological distress that's well documented, statistically documented, mm -hmm. and written about by adolescent psychologists that this system produces is something we've never seen yeah. before. That wouldn't change, mm -hmm. and the socioeconomic skew wouldn't change, because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of money to yeah. produce a kid who can clear the bar. That's the problem. Yeah. So I'm going to switch topics and talk about employment for a bit. And the person uh, who was uh, uh, last week, the center hosted Jamie Marisotis, the uh, head of the Lumina Foundation, who is just um, to talk about his book that he's just published called America Needs Talent. And it was fascinating to be reading your books at the same time because they're both equally passionate. They're both offering a diagnosis of what's wrong with American higher education, but very, very different diagnoses. So Jamie feels that higher education has become unaccountable for its actual purpose. What, how much students learn, what students learn, and uh, their preparation for their career, whatever that career is that they choose. So in higher education, as he would like to see it, this is a quote from his book, every student will know where he or she is going how much it will cost to get there, how much time it will take, and what to expect at the journey's end, both in terms of learning outcomes and career prospects. So admittedly, the, you're talking about the, admi admittedly you're talking about different sectors of higher education. Jamie is very focused on community colleges, but but would you what what would you say in response to what Jamie says well, about what he wants for every student? This is one of the most powerful foundations in the higher education space, as you know. Um, I don't know the book, so I only know what you just read. Yeah. And uh, so I may be wrong in saying that I agree with half of what he says. I think higher education has become really unaccountable. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, uh, the tenured professoriate mainly is checked out. They have mm -hmm. no incentive to tune into anything that's going on. I think that the university system got f 
fat and lazy and complacent during the boom years mm -hmm. and has had 40 years to adjust and in many ways hasn't. And sometimes I hear things that tenured people say or that people tell me they say, and I think, you know, it's France and it's 1788. Uh -huh. And, and uh -huh. they're going to wake up one day and blood's going to uh -huh. be running in the streets and they're going to wonder what happened. And the answer is they happened. Yeah. Because, because they, they're so insulated that they haven't had to change. Now, the second half, I, I'm sure I radically disagree with him because yeah, he's one of the people, and they are the dominant voices in education. This is what I talk about, global yeah. neoliberal education. Mm -hmm. That the purpose of education is, as Scott Walker said, to meet the state's workforce needs, right? Uh -huh. That's how he wanted to rewrite the charter of the University of Wisconsin, meet the state's workforce needs. Mm -hmm. I was on a panel on Japanese television. You know, Japan wants to do away with the liberal arts, mm -hmm. like literally do away with mm -hmm. the liberal arts. Um, how are we going to meet global workforce, global human resources? Mm -hmm. And I finally said, you know, students are not human resources to be mm -hmm. exploited like oil or gas, to be mm -hmm. monetized. They're human beings, and that's mm -hmm. how we need to think of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think that students do need to know how much it's going to cost, and I do think that universities need to help, in many ways, community colleges maybe need to help bridge, bridge um, the gap between education and and, and employment, but not in the way that he thinks. And the notion that you need to have a set uh, endpoint mm -hmm. is antithetical to everything I believe about education mm -hmm. and about college in particular. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine uh, who's a designer and writes about art, she, she distinguishes between design thinking, where you're trying to get from A to B, mm -hmm. and art thinking, mm -hmm. which is an open-ended process, and you mm -hmm. discover the endpoint. Uh -huh. and, it, it's pretty clear to me I, that that's what education should be. Yeah. It's really striking. I completely agree with you. And uh, But it's fascinating to me that we have, in very close juxtaposition, these two very different ideas about um, uh, American higher education. One, very workforce, um, uh, workforce directed, although Jamie would say what he cares about are the students and the students being able to um, uh, uh, be assured of a good economic future. And it's striking that both of your books were written in the aftermath of the recession. Uh, and I, what, how, how do you think about um, college in relationship to career preparation. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I want to say, I mean, I think those concerns are perfectly legitimate. And, mm -hmm. and, and students, uh, you know, we are right to be concerned. I mean, students need to go and make a living. And mm -hmm. what can we do about that? We can uh, make sure that they get through college with a lot less debt or no debt or not mm -hmm. having to pay anything right. in, in the, to begin with. I think a lot of the other problems, though, are problems with the way the, the economy is structured now. I mean, it's a winner-take-all economy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been no economic progress, and you know, most of the uh, economic spectrum for many. I mean, that. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what a college can do about that. Uh -huh. um, it's because I, I I believe so much in the value of a liberal arts education, and actually, I believe in it as a right of citizenship mm -hmm. that the, the students who are going to community colleges let alone Berkeley or Yale, deserve to have and deserve to have provided for them if they want to do it and do the work, mm -hmm. if they want it and want to do the work. But because I believe in it so much, I think colleges actually need to make an effort to help connect that kind of education to, to career. Not, uh -huh. by, not by distorting the education, which tends mm -hmm. to be what happens, mm -hmm. but by helping students, and especially students who aren't in STEM fields, <laughs> mm -hmm. imagine futures for themselves, uh -huh. connect themselves to the job market in an active way. And yeah. I think there are different ways that colleges can do that. And I don't know of any college that's doing it particularly well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. You talk about students in your book feeling anxious, timid, and lost, as if that's a bad thing. And I, I, I think being anxious, timid, and lost is part of growing up. And, and I, I wonder, how do, you, how do you connect? I mean, you're very powerful um, diagnosis of a lot that, of, of what's wrong in our socialization of, of, of young people towards success today with just what is the mess and muddle of growing up where most individuals do feel anxious, timid, and lost well, if he, they're he, really thinking no, about I, the I, issues I, in their lives. I understand what you're saying, but I actually disagree. I uh -huh. think there's a normal kind of disorientation that it's an important developmental stage of young adulthood. Mm -hmm. And I think the anxious, timid, and lost thing is precisely because they're not being given the opportunity or the tools to go through that kind of wander years, uh -huh. right, that I remember going through. Mm -hmm. um, because 
because they've been inculcated with an intense risk of failure and with, uh, with a sense that life is a straight path and you just jump through the hoops that the grown-ups hold up for you. Yeah. So typically what happens when they get to the end of college is they either look for more hoops, which is a lot of what going to Wall Street is about or law school or medical school, or they're really lost but without the kinds of tools to go through those first few years after college and you know, be depressed and be confused and that's sort of normal but they actually don't have that. And that's why we see these mental health statistics really changing. I mean, if we, if that, uh -huh. if we didn't have that to rely on, we could say this is just normal. But mm -hmm. I don't think, and the psychologists who write about this, Madeline Levine and other mm -hmm. people, yeah. this is something different mm -hmm. and it's not the healthy thing. Mm -hmm. There, I was really interested in your arguments about risk in the book, and I'm fascinated by the question of how you build risk into a college education. So there was an alumna at Smith who felt very strongly about risk and actually gave Smith an endowment to bring somebody to the college who would talk about risk. And she said, I don't mean business risk. Mm -hmm. I mean risk in your personal life. And so the first people we brought for this, you know, kind of residency were uh, three sisters who had come to Smith. Um, and we found out in the course of this residency that their father, they both were, they, each of them were, were, took great risks in their personal lives to great consequence. Their father made them all, as they were growing up, jump off the garage roof to teach them risk. Now, I'm not suggesting jumping off the garage Although roof. Although it might not like, be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you, how, how can you build risk into a, an education with a, with, in a culture that places such a, um, uh, uh, there's such a strong aversion to failure with it. It's, it's a good question, and I want to stipulate uh, that, as, as someone else said, uh, uh, my business is complaining, not answers. <laughs> and I'm not particularly good. I, I, have, no, I have no practice in, po in policy design. But I will say that I, I went back to the classroom this spring. I taught a writing class at Scripps College. Uh -huh. and, um, and I was dealing with students who were, who were perfectionists. And mm -hmm. this was a writing class. And the first thing I said to them is, it's not possible to do perfect yeah. work, so don't even worry about it. Yeah. And some of them struggled the whole semester with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I also uh, borrowed something that they do at Reed, mm -hmm. which is that they give students grades, but they don't tell them what they are, uh -huh. um, which was great. Mm -hmm. It was great for about two thirds of the semester, and then the last third of the semester, like the absence of those uh, reg electric shocks at regular intervals, uh -huh. kind of reduced the motivation of some of the students. Mm -hmm. But it but it freed them to take chances because they didn't have that immediate feedback. Yeah. Um, so I mean, those are a couple of things that that we can implement. I mean, somehow. I mean, I, I think it's. I mean, I, part of what I'm saying is that I think mm -hmm. it's a lot of this is like the texture of the classroom. Yes. And what's the reward system, and and what do the assignments look like? I mean, open and open-ended assignments that don't, maybe don't get graded or don't have right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have been talking about this in a number of different connections yeah. for a while anyway. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, I mean, so much of these problems are systemic and yeah. any one person in the, in even a university president is really constrained by what they can do. So if it's a job market that only looks at people with perfect GPAs <laughs> mm -hmm. or law or law schools, what, what can you say? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. The conversations that I had with, I've had in the course of my career with people who hire say they're not interested in GPAs. They're interested in passion and risk taking. So uh, maybe that's, well, a, that's an important great. message. Well, here's the, I think there's a whole set of messages to get to these students. And, and one of them is it doesn't matter what you major in. Yeah, right. And, but the problem right. is you can say this a hundred times. Mm -hmm. You can tie them down and shout it at them and they mm -hmm. can't hear it. Yeah. And I often end up in conversations with people in your kind of position saying, you know, we're tearing our hair out. Like, we know these things and we can't communicate it to students and their parents. Yeah. Maybe we need to keep trying or maybe we need to do it in different ways or maybe we need to get uh, business leaders more involved in delivering that message because obviously we have no credibility yeah. to deliver it. No, yeah. I mean, we don't. I mean, yeah, that's no, re reasonable. No, I think that's right. I mean, I, you, you tell to students that, the, you know, but with the other, you know, your other hand, you're grading them on their assignments and you're turning your grades in. So it's no, a little bit. That's true. But I also you know, meant like we're not doing the hiring, so they're not going to believe a bunch of professors. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And the hiring we do is very merit, meritocratic. Yes, we could talk about excellent sheep in a different connection. Yes, but, um. that's, right. that's true. So you say that our housing a liberal arts co college in a research university is untenable. 
but that's what we have. And so how do you make the best of what you say is untenable? Right. I mean, that's that sort of structural contradiction in American mm -hmm. higher education. Yeah. I, think, uh, I think that we need, we really need to get serious about either having a parallel teaching faculty mm -hmm. that has every bit as much institutional prestige, uh -huh. same rank, same salary, same administrative power mm -hmm. as a research faculty, or some kind of combination either or. Uh -huh. You know, places talk about it, but I've never heard of any place that really has done that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. what do you think? You think I there's think a chance that that could happen? I, I wish it would, because I think that that, uh, that would be a, a good solution to what Clark Kerr um, also right. identified as a structural problem within these multiversities that we've created. Look, and what's happened is that we now have uh, f the full the full-time non-tenure track mm -hmm. is now a third not adjuncts, not graduates, but full-time non-tenure. Yeah. I'm sure you've got a lot of them here. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, in effect, a teaching faculty, yeah. but they don't have equal status and wealth, yeah. uh, or job, let alone job security. They don't have, they don't yeah. have tenure by definition. Yeah. So yeah. in other words, it's evolved, but it's yeah. kind of evolved in the back door and not in a satisfactory way. Yeah. So there was, I don't know, some of you may have seen this too, there was a column that appeared in yesterday's New York Times by David Brooks called The Big University, and he has a bunch of recommendations, which most of which I think you would be sympathetic to. In fact, I wondered Maybe whether he had read your book, book and that it yeah, was yeah. using that as material for his yeah. column. But one thing he said that really struck me, um, he's quoting um, a, a passage from Nietzsche, um, actually, he's quoting Maria Popova, who's quoting a passage from Nietzsche. Let the young soul survey its own life with a view of the following question. Um, what have you truly loved thus far? What has ever uplifted your soul? What has dominated and delighted it at the same time? And he talks about um, college as about falling in love. And right. I don't wonder if you could just talk about that a little bit, right. or whether you think that that's a good way of well, describing college. It, it is, but I'm also wary of it. And my biggest chapter is about how you sort of find that thing. And I'm, and I'm careful and self-conscious about what we call that thing. Passion is a, is a complete cliche now. Mm -hmm. I think purpose is a better word. Mm -hmm. You can tell, you know, that cliche of just do what you love. Mm -hmm. First of all, um, we shouldn't get focused on any single word. And it can, and it can misguide students. I, I don't know how to find my passion. I don't just have one passion, you know. I, I feel terrible, even more stressed, because I have to find my passion. I have to find it by the time I get out of college. <laughs> but also, this gets back.